my name is Amanda Ellis and fabulous to see the panel before. I am the Executive Director for the Global Institute of Sustainability and Innovation and am just so thrilled to be co-moderating today with somebody I'm a huge fan of, Paul Srivastava, who was the founder of Future Earth, is actually huh? an academic entrepreneur, which I think is a wonderful, wonderful way of putting it. We have with us today a range of other panelists, and I'm hoping that you can see the list of our wonderful panelists today, and a special shout out to globally renowned futurist, Hazel Henderson. As you know, this session is on SDG4 and how we can include, ensure inclusive and equitable quality education and promote lifelong learning for all. So I want to start with a focus on Code Red for Humanity. This is, as Ocean's icon Sylvia Earle says, the decisive decade for humanity. This decade will determine our future for the next 10,000 years. So we know that we are in the sixth great mass extinction of species. And we know that we have the highest number of refugees and displaced persons in history. But at 87 million, that pales into insignificance with the predictions of 1 billion by the end of the century if we do not act. And education is absolutely key to that. So on the positive side of the ledger, as we all know, for the first time in human history and her story, we have a globally agreed development agenda, 17 sustainable development goals agreed by 193 UN member countries in 2015. And as I was the New Zealand ambassador to the UN in Geneva at the time, I can attest that they are not perfect, but it is a remarkable achievement to have a common agenda and a common language. And as UNESCO points out, sustainable development begins with education. In my previous role at the World Bank, we all agreed that education was the silver bullet for development. So I want to end with a very personal story before passing to Paul. When I ran New Zealand's development agency, I tried very hard to get universities involved in solving the big problems that we had in the Pacific. And as the previous panel pointed out, there wasn't a transdisciplinary approach. Real world problems were too complicated for the very siloed approach that universities take. So imagine my delight in 2016 when I met visionary philanthropist Julianne Wrigley at the International Union for the Conservation of Nature uh, in Hawaii and found that she had founded the first Global Institute of Sustainability in 2003 on the premise that every student at the university she endowed, Arizona State University, would graduate with a sustainability competency. And that has made all the difference. 140,000 students now graduate with a sustainability competency. But just last year, and this is the challenge that I want to throw out to everybody, Julie founded the Global Futures Laboratory on the basis that sustainability is no longer enough. We need regenerative global futures through transdisciplinary solutions grounded in indigenous wisdom. We need circular economy and we need drawdown, both nature-based solutions and technological solutions if we are to save our planet or save actually the planet will be fine, save the people on the planet this decade. So I am absolutely thrilled to be part of today's discussion with such a group of diverse and brilliant people and now pass to Paul to set the scene specifically. Thank you so much, Paul. Thank you, Amanda, and welcome to everyone. Good morning, good evening, wherever you are. Uh, Amanda seems to have found a, a really good solution for humanity by being in the Mars environment. And I'd like to make a, a suggestion that we better preserve the Earth here, otherwise we'll all be looking to get to the Mars environment. But our focus today is on education for sustainability. So I just want to say a few words. There are really interesting panelists and 
we want to keep most of the time for them. Amanda and I will sort of usher in the session. And uh, I want to begin by raising a few questions around education for sustainability so that the panelists may wish to address some of them or also bring out their own thoughts. So first thing I want to talk about is the scale of the education challenge for the future, education for sustainability. According to UNESCO, more than 262 million children and youth are out of school right now. And this is likely to increase and perhaps even double by the middle of the century. Of the 617 million children and adolescents, 60% are not acquiring even basic literacy and numeracy, even after several years in school because their schools are not equipped to deliver knowledge and 750 million adults are illiterate. There are other stats on what is needed to fulfill this goal, and they're really all daunting. One estimate suggested we would need 60 million teachers to overcome this deficit. And the amount of funding needed for this would have to go from a current investment of about 1.2 trillion to 3 trillion, more than two and a half times by 2030. So this is a big problem. If education is going to be for all, and as Amanda already said, education is a kind of prerequisite for meeting all the other sustainable development goals. We really need to focus on this particular goal. It is not going to happen by itself. And there are many, many competing priorities among our political and economic leaders, uh, especially in a pandemic racked economically shrinking and unequal world. So how do we create this capacity is one of the questions I hope the panelists would consider addressing in their remarks. How can universities, how can schools build capacity to meet the goal, the, the education goal in, among the sustainable development goals? Is it even possible to do so with the current governance and business models that universities have adopted today? And what are some alternatives to the forms and business models of universities and colleges that can enable capacity creation at scale? A sec I have answers to some of these questions or at least some directions, but I'm going to hold off my own ideas. I want to just lay out uh, two more areas for the panelists to consider. So besides capacity, the second one is content. What is currently being taught in universities? Uh, most universities are built around disciplinary lines and they've been doing this disciplinary silo education for well over 300 years, uh, preparing students for jobs. That is sort of the raison d'etre of modern universities. The right content for a climate altered world is something different, I believe. It needs to be transdisciplinary, taking problems from the real world and applying knowledge to solve them. And we need to make higher education more relevant to the needs of the Anthropocene. So what content might be relevant and how might it be delivered? And then the third question that comes to my mind is, In my more pessimistic moments, I think there is going to be a, a huge disruption uh, caused by climate and by declining biodiversity. And people would at some level need to have skills for sustenance. So how can universities and colleges educate students to meet sustenance needs in food, water, energy, and build livelihoods that are supportive of community resilience. What content would that look like? So these are just some sort of provocations, if you will. I'll stop here and hand over to so Hazel. So thank you. you. Thank you so much. Well, I'm just going to try to engage in what we do, which is metaphysical reconstruction. And it's a very good uh, consulting business and not enough people in it. And uh, what I really want to talk about um, is the failure of traditional 
economics and uh, the GDP model. And gratefully, we're going to the SDGs now, but we're still stuck in most business schools um, with the GDP model and the price system. And uh, this, you, you cannot possibly uh, move forward by trying to use this kind of single metric because prices really are a measure of human ignorance. They're always uh, looking, they're always historic. And today we don't know the price of anything, um, you know, with all the cryptocurrencies and everything else. And of course, that the convention in accounting is still to allow for externalities, um, which makes really um, the whole system fraudulent. So I just want to, um, uh, to just uh, go into this a little more deeply. And uh, many years ago, when I wrote this book, uh, The Politics of the Solar Age in uh, 1981, uh, which of course nobody understood then, <laughs> you know, being discussed now as the Green New Deal. <laughs> but back then, nobody understood what I was talking about. Uh, what I was really saying is that the total productive system of industrial societies, um, the top two layers of that cake are the only ones that are quantified in the price system and GDP monetized and everything like that. And the top, the lower two layers, which really support the entire thing, um, are still not in enough economic textbooks and not in enough business schools and financial classes. And what I call the love economy in every society, the traditional economy of the golden rule, do as you would be done by, you know, mutual interdependence. Those love economies in every society in the world are still much larger than the GDP money measured market sectors, which they still enfold and support. Uh, but they're being stressed all the time because they're based on voluntary mutual cooperation. And of course, uh, Mother Nature was completely ignored for many years, that was part of the externalities. So the model that I continue to use, and now that uh, this model, I get questions every almost every day for groups wanting to use it as a basis of uh, going beyond the GDP model to basically, this is the SDG model, the whole cake is the SGG model. So what we have done at um, Ethical Markets, which I founded in 2004, you know, we don't take advertising. I fund it basically, you know, with our television program royalties and whatnot. And um, we, um, in we, with our partner, GlobeScan, um, we presented uh, the survey, the first survey we did in 12 countries of ordinary citizens, asking them uh, whether you should use GDP, money-based GDP as the best measure of global, of, of your country's development, or should you also include science-based metrics on um, health, uh, social and environmental statistics. And we did it, I presented the first one at the European Parliament in 2007, where they had the, the Beyond GDP conference. And it was absolutely uh, filled to the gills. Uh, all countries were represented in the European countries, and you can go to um, uh, you can go to beyond-gdp.eu, and they still put out reports all the time on this. Uh, we repeated that, that the first one was 2007, where we found these huge majorities, and uh, we repeated it in 2009 because we wondered whether people had been, because of the financial crisis, whether they had been regressed back into fear, you know. But no, that, that's held up. Then we did it in 2013. This is the one we did this year. And you can see those statistics are pretty much holding up. The next one is coming out next May. 
So we keep on banging on about education as the basic investment that every society has to make in producing um, healthy, literate citizens. And yet uh, too long uh, in GDP, um, uh, education is still categorized as consumption rather than an investment. And the problem with GDP is it still doesn't have an asset account. So you have all of these investments needed, backed up, needed in public in infrastructure, public goods, green, you know, the whole shift to um, the Green New Deal, and of course, education. And if you had that asset account where all of these uh, public investments were properly valued and put on the other side of the balance sheet, uh, all countries' debt to GDP ratios could be cut by up to 50%, just with a couple of keystrokes. So it really is silly to go on doing this. And of course, we all know that money isn't scarce. It's not wealth. Money is simply a social protocol um, that we all happen to believe in. And the currencies fluctuate all over the world based simply on how many people trust them and use them. And of course, we remember over the history um, of, uh, of uh, uh, societies, um, every time societies have gotten into a real jam with unrepayable debts, they've had a jubilee where debts are simply wiped out. And the last time this happened, if you all remember, was in the year 2000 um, with the uh, Jubilee 2000 uh, campaign by NGOs to uh, wipe off or wipe away most of the debts of the highly um, indebted uh, HIPAA countries. So we know how to do this. And um, so basically, um, I was very interested um, in uh, looking at what happened at COP26, where you had the financial community finally realizing they were gonna to have to jump into this game. So Mark Carney came there and announced this uh, group of financiers and their 130 trillion um, that they were gonna to commit to uh, climate change and net zero and all of this, um, met with tremendous skepticism by almost everybody, uh, and me too, because see, uh, if they really have that kind of power, which they do, you know, they own most legislators through um, lobbying and all of this. So um, if they really were serious about uh, committing that 130 uh, uh, trillion, um, uh, what they uh, should have been supporting, which was discussed at COP26, and that is, hey, why don't we have the central banks of the rich countries simply make the next quantitative easing instead of buying up dud mortgages, um, putting them on their balance sheet, uh, why not have green QE and buy green bonds, you know, and all of this. And similarly with the IMF, uh, what Kristalina Georgieva did, uh, very much criticized, like the economists wanted to get her fired. But what she did was instead of doing loans to countries so that they could get vaccines, she gave them grants. And so you could do exactly the same thing at the IMF. You could have another issue of special drawing rights, green SDRs, and let's put that 100 uh, billion a year into the developing countries as we promised to do, and also add the 1.3 trillion a year so that developing countries can leapfrog uh, from the fossil fuels to the now cheaper, cleaner solar, wind, and energy efficiency. So uh, we all know now, um, all the NGO communities, that governments create money through their central banks. and. Uh, in, the, in our constitution in the USA, it's the Congress um, that creates the money. So um, of course, our educational priorities, I have very much enjoyed uh, listening in on all these conversations. So, you know, civics now um, and, and literacy now means uh, agreement on a very basic new meta story. 
And most of our children, like the 4 million young people who refused to go to school and join Greta Thunberg uh, in talking about, let's forget the fairy tales about GDP growth. Um, basically, the meta story which most NGOs at COP26 and most of our children and the climate change activists agree on um, is basically we are all one species, we humans. We know that from our DNA. 2% of our DNA um, is from Neanderthals. So, you know, it goes back that far. And we know too that we are completely interdependent and dependent on all of the other species in the biosphere and maintaining the um, diversity of the biosphere. And we know also that we live on an abundant planet. We get all of these free photons every day, which um, the plants are, uh, in our biosphere have learned with the first technology in the world, which is photosynthesis, how to turn those, photo, uh, those photons into carbohydrates and our food supply and everything that we need to survive. All we need to do is to regain um, the mutual aid and community sectors and um, value them uh, more highly. And we need media literacy now. I'll talk more about that later because it involves um, the social media in the US that have no rules at all and no liability and are transmitting misinformation about viruses um, at the speed of light. And of course, uh, normal uh, academic and media companies can't possibly keep up. So I want to look at the whole thing about teaching technological literacy. And um, I learned about that through my role as a cabinet level science advisor to the US Office of Technology Assessment, OTA. And I uh, joined OTA uh, in 1975 um, as one of its advisors. And um, in 1977, we put on the Asilomar Conference, uh, which for the first time said to genetic engineering um, in academia, stop, we need a moratorium. And we had a, a, an actual moratorium, uh, which still exists um, on, on that. And today, uh, even though OTA only lasted from 1975 till 1996, when the Republicans came in and uh, destroyed it because our research was far too truthful uh, to too many special interests uh, and was shut down. Uh, now um, it's back on the agenda of the Biden administration and will probably be revived uh, because today's technological issues are about regulating um, art artificial intelligence. Really is no such thing. It, it's human trained machine learning. Uh, is nothing artificial about it. And uh, monitoring algorithms and making them uh, open and um, searchable uh, and also shifting social media to the public interest. Uh, and of course the shift to circular economies. These all require uh, taking all the marvelous Cartesian reductionist research that we, we now have and integrating it uh, into public policy. So um, I just um, wrote an article which went live today, uh, basically uh, talking about the need to slow down, to slow down the speed of infotech. And see Silicon Valley now uh, digitizing everything for profit, let's face it, it's all for profit, um, is basically, um, operating at the speed of light. And we have to remember from our physics lessons that um, human beings are bound uh, on this planet by the laws of thermodynamics. And our hearts only beat so fast, our legs only take us so far, 
And it still takes 365 days for our planet to circulate our mother star, the sun. And so um, instead of what's happening now, which we're all being urged to catch up, catch up, speed up uh, somehow um, to uh, achieve these speeds um, that are going by the speed of light, um, we have to stop and uh, take another look at it. And I was just quoting from the new book called The, um, the Age of, AT of AI by, of all people, Henry Kissinger and this former CEO of Google, uh, Eric Schmidt. And uh, they are making the same point. And uh, they're saying that the human mind um, simply isn't, doesn't function at internet speeds. And so uh, we have to slow down the internet speeds. We can't change. Uh, we can't, the human minds are never going to be able to operate at the speed of light. And so I first caught on to this mismatch between these physical realms um, in a paper I did for the UN called Perspectives on Reforming Electronic Markets and Trading. And of course, we realized with these high frequency traders, just to make money out of money, um, they are speeding up trading um, by nanoseconds, you know, and I mean, it's absurd. It's all childish stuff. And we know how to stop it because we did uh, in Al Asilomar in 1977, um, in the case of genetic engineering. So we're not helpless. We can steer our intellect. Um, and this is an article I did in Cadmus for the World Academy, uh, toward public interest and maturity and these common uh, understandings and common goals. And I, I just wanna end by saying that we are making progress. Uh, the golden rule um, was the first way, the first time centuries ago, where humans actually pretty much agreed um, on a mutual responsibility uh, with the whole uh, do as you would be done by, a perfect system statement. And then fast forward to the year 1215 in England with Magna Carta, another huge advance with the writ of habeas corpus, when we said, the king doesn't own your body, you own your own body. And we've updated that at Ethical Markets, you also own your own mind and the information that you generate, um, which we're not going to allow these uh, social media companies to sell all of our information um, and make money out of it. Then um, we can fast forward to 1948 with uh, Eleanor Roosevelt's work and the UN De Declaration of Human Rights. And then to the year 2000, where I was thrilled to participate in the launching of the Earth Charter, which was almost accepted by the UN that the 16 principles of human responsibility, and I still promote um, the Earth Charter as far, as far as I can. And you go to earthcharter.org for that. So it, it's, um, this is what education has to be about now. This true human situation on planet Earth. Planet Earth is now teaching us direct, directly, whether it's pandemics or climate uh, catastrophes. So we're going beyond narcissism and anthropocentrism. And uh, so thank you so much, appreciate it. Thank you, Hazel. That was really wonderful. It really <laughs> opens up. It is very positive message. I am left with a sense of hope that despite the big challenge I pointed to at the beginning, you have actually provided both a financial picture as well as a human picture of how we can solve the problem. So thank you very much. I hand over to Amanda. Thank you so much, Paul. And I wanted to echo your comments about Hazel's brilliance. The OECD has also estimated that between 95 and $130 trillion in ecosystem services are being provided. So GDP is indeed an absurd measure. 
which was never supposed to have gone beyond World War II. So it is one of the things we really do need to focus on. And thank you so much, Hazel, uh, for your brilliance and the work that you have done over the years. We're all looking forward to reading the article that you published today. Now it is my very great pleasure to introduce our first speaker. And I wanted to start actually with a youth perspective. So Kekeshan Basu, I hope that you are ready to go because an intergenerational approach as well as a transdisciplinary approach is what I believe is really needed for us to think about education in a different way. And you have so many awards, I cannot read them all. So I'm just going to sum it up by saying you're a youth activist, you were the 2016 International Children's Peace Prize winner. You're a National Geographic Young Explorer, and you are a founder of the Green Hope Foundation. And we certainly need that right now. The floor is yours. Thank you very much, Amanda. And hello, everyone. Uh, it's wonderful to be on this virtual platform with all of you. As Amanda said, I'm the founder president of Green Hope Foundation, and I'm also a UN Human Rights Champion. And my organization, Green Hope Foundation, works across 25 countries to impart education for sustainable development to everyone, especially in those uh, in vulnerable communities. So we are currently living in a world where digital dividends coexist with digital divides. And as uh, you know, as has been mentioned before, we know now that as the world becomes increasingly interconnected, so do the risks that we face, because we have new variants that are still emerging. COVID-19 is far from over, and it's not stopped at national borders, and it really has affected people regardless of nationality, level of education, income, or gender, but the same has not been true for the consequences, which of course have hit the most vulnerable the hardest. And it's really widened pre-existing inequalities and including that of the digital divide, which I really feel has in general discourse hasn't been addressed enough because that digital divide has literally pushed millions out of the education system simply because of the technological barrier that really prevents them from digitally reconnecting to a distance learning system. So we have students from wealthy backgrounds with parental support and desire to learn and residing in, well, both developed and developing countries that have now been able to make their way past closed school doors to these alternate learning uh, mechanisms. But in the global south and particularly in LDCs and small island developing states in their rural communities, schools have closed down for good. And there are, as we know, millions who ha now have no access to education, but there's still an abyssal lack of data in this regard because the number is way bigger. And as someone who's been working in these communities in multiple countries for uh, the past many years, I've seen firsthand the grotesque impacts on young people, and especially girls. In rural Liberia, for instance, these communities witnessed an upsurge in youth getting swept away into the vicious cycle of drugs and crime. In rural Bangladesh and India, the communities we work in witnessed an exponential increase in child marriages, in domestic violence, in trafficking. And there are really hundreds, if not thousands, of such communities around the globe who really continue to remain invisible and excluded from the statistics of COVID-19 impacts. And that includes on education. And even that includes even in vaccine uh, equality. While in the Western world, we're discussing booster shots and booster shots for students, none of the people in the communities we've worked with have even received their first dose. So this is the level of disparity and inequity that still exists. And while it's important for every child everywhere to have access to education, because that's a basic human right, now we must begin to prioritize or focus on regions where the widest gaps exist. So the first step must be to assess and quantify the gaps. We urgently need policy interventions and political will to highlight these anomalies and provide the resources to assimilate the segregated data. And once we have the data and the analytics, we can then devise solutions because as the old adage goes, what gets measured gets done. And that's essentially true for 
the current way of functioning in our education systems as well. And simultaneously, we need to focus on being innovative in our efforts to bridge the technology divide in terms of education. So in that context, I'd like to quickly highlight two of our initiatives at Green Hope Foundation, where at, there is a lack, lack of access to education, and that's uh, amplified even further by lack of access of, to infrastructure. So in Bangladesh and Liberia and the rural communities there, we've used clean energy innovation in the form of solar grids to bring electricity to schools and community centers that now serve as centers of learning. And even in this 21st century, when billionaires are vying amongst themselves to go on space missions, there are still millions of homes without electricity where women and girls cannot venture out at night in the dark. So through these solar grids, we've installed routers where we're powering Wi-Fi hotspots that facilitate learning through a digital platform in, additional, uh, in addition to providing well-lit safe spaces for young people, women to learn vocational skills in the evenings. And the objective is really to build skill sets to change behaviors, provide them with the knowledge that facilitates the creation of local circular bioeconomies so that they can perpetuate revenue streams within their own communities. And this is really the transformation of the current archaic education systems that they must transform into so that they can become future-proof. And the second initiative is in the form of a solar-powered mobile library that's managed by our trained local youth ambassadors where this solar-powered van full of books travels to remote villages, taking the library to the doorstep of children who've been forced to drop out of school due to COVID and uh, climate change and biodiversity loss just intersecting and creating wrecking havoc on their lives in short. So we've been currently reaching out to over 250,000 children across villages in Asia and Africa. So as non-state actors, our efforts are filling the void. That is, in many cases, the responsibility of the region's governments. But at the same time, it's also the responsibility of us as civil society, of all of us to contribute in resolving this issue that still plagues our education systems rather than just protesting on the streets and blaming governments, but actually holding ourselves and everyone else accountable as a collective humanity. So we know how the pandemic is the greatest crisis in living memory. In addition to that, we have climate change, biodiversity loss, the threat of nuclear weapons, all of these existential threats that really are throwing new challenges at us every day. So just to quickly conclude, it will really require cross-cutting cooperation amongst multiple stakeholders between governments, international organizations, local political establishments, network service providers, hardware, software rent vendors, digital content producers, education systems, and of course, civil society actors like us who will implement the last mile. So every cog in the cycle is critical none more important than the other, and it can only function if we're all in sync. And therein lies the challenge. Is it impossible to achieve? No. Is it difficult? Yes. But do we have a choice? No, we do not. So this is really the path we must follow in order to transform our education systems, move towards education for sustainable development that embodies empathy for people and planet to really ensure a just and equitable world for all where no one is left behind. Thank you. Brilliant. Thank you, Kikishan. A just and equitable world where no one is left behind. And your call for radical collaboration could not be more timely. Loved your idea of this, how do we ensure that digital dividends can coexist with digital divides? And a huge thank you from everybody for the extraordinary work that you are leading uh, in collaboration with so many in emerging markets and with your special focus on women and girls. Thank you so much. And now let's hear from the United Nations. Chanteline Carpentier, who leads the UNCTAD office in New York, and is an extraordinarily accomplished woman. Don't get too close. She's a black belt and also is found running marathons in her spare time. Uh, Chanteline, it's wonderful to see you again. We look forward to your thoughts. 
Thank you so much. And it's a pleasure and an honor. And actually, it's a bit intimidating to follow um, Hazel and Kekashan, who is a good friend. Um, so, and, and to see you, <laughs> of course. Um, so basically, let me start by telling a little story. So last summer, I did this summer school and uh, for new, new economics thinking with uh, that Ong Tad puts out with the New Economic Institute. And uh, out of that course, I thought, okay, and I had just been talking with some a common friend, Amanda and I have, Tess, about the, um, the Club of Rome report that says uh, transition is still possible. And they said that it's still possible to achieve the SDG by 2030, um, but with the current economic system that we have, we can only achieve SDG one to six, uh, one to nine, at the expense of SDG 10 to SDG 16. So the clear conclusion is, and it's been kind of alluded to uh, by all the speakers, is that we need new economics for sustainable development. And so um, I basically went to our chief economist and said, Elliot, we need to work on new economics for sustainable development, because he had just created um, this network of economists within the UN, which didn't exist before, which is pretty surprising when you think about it. And the reason is because we at UNCTAD, uh, along with other at UNIDOS and, and the original commission had pushed through the reform of the UN that we have an economist in each of the country team of the UN. Because otherwise we focus on the social issues and we don't address the root causes of, of poverty and inequality. And um, to my great dismise <laughs> and surprise, uh, Elliot agreed. And so we basically now have been working on new economics for sustainable development. And what does that mean? Well, we've been, we started by saying, okay, people are talking about the green economy and the green recovery from COVID-19, um, but what about the blue economy? Because we all remember at Rio that uh, the SIDS, the small island developing states said, well, green is not really working for us. Blue economy works for us. And then people have mentioned the circular economy. That's great. But none of those intrinsically actually include a redistribution of income, a equalizing of income or an inclusive part. And so we have also a policy brief on social and solidarity economy, which is very widespread in the non-Anglo-Saxon world where, and a, a typical example would be for, for example, cooperatives or uh, company owned, uh, employee owned companies, for instance, that would by their own structure, not aim necessarily to just maximize profit all the time, but to maximize the well-being of everyone. Um, and then you need to meet, miss and match those with the other. We also have one, and I would like to um, elaborate that on that, on the purple economy, one on the orange economy, one on the yellow economy, and the frugal innovation, because all of these are building blocks for what the new economics for sustainable development would look like. And we've been developing these briefs, and one thing that came clear um, is we need the help of universities. We are unearthing so many questions, research que questions that we need to, um, we need help of universities and people on the ground to help us with. Um, and let me start by saying that, um, and many of you will have heard that already, our Secretary General at the UN has been calling for urgently addressing the three um, uh, planetary crises that we have, climate change, biodiversity, and pollution. And I would say we have a fourth um, uh, crisis, which is the inequality. And I do believe that by putting these building blocks of this colored economy together, um, we can get um, a long way. We also, so let me start with this, the purple economy, which is the care economy, uh, but plus, plus, plus. So care economy, what is this? Well, a lot, the majority of the care economy is provided. This is part of ASO's uh, loving cake. I, this is the care provided by mostly women around the world to the elderly, to the communities, to the, the youth that is not paid for, not accounted in our GDP, in our accounting system. And which means that if you don't quantify this unpaid labor and you develop policies based on these data, you will have misguided policies to start with. So how do we work with the universities and the research institution to actually help us to quantify unpaid labor so that we can um, actually bring this to the attention of the decision makers so we can change it? We also know that the, and it's been alluded to in the previous session, and I think in this session as well, 
this idea of considering education as part of expenditure from the government. We know that care work enable future economic growth by reproducing a workforce that is fit, productive, capable of innovation, then public spending that enables the sufficient supplies and adequate quality of this workforce should be conceived as a productive investment, just like investing in railways and port and bridges, um, and therefore not an expenditure. And there's several studies that show that high, um, inv so investment in social infrastructure, such as education, have a higher multiplier effect um, and economic growth, but we need to quantify those. Um, in, in different contexts, so we can actually bring that to the uh, attention of decision makers, so we don't keep on bypassing these very important issues. Um, we, and, and you mentioned, Amanda, what we're doing at the UN, and I'm very pleased to say that the Secretary General, for those of you that have not seen it, has just issued our common agenda in September that calls for actually the, the one little orphan from Rio plus 20, which is SDG target 17.19, which is the development of measurement of progress on that is beyond GDP. And so we are now tasked at the UN, all of our principles have been tasked to actually um, accelerate the work on the GDP, GDP plus measure. We also at the Statistical Commission have already uh, developed a system of environmental economic accounting, which is an ecosystem um, accounting that augment the GDP measure with measures of natural capital, such as forests and ocean and other ecosystem. So that's the bottom part of Azel's cake. Um, and now what we're doing is basically adding to the satellite account pieces on unpaid work and all the other issues in that case that were not quantified. Now, to get to uh, quickly to the question um, uh, that you had put to us, Paul, let me say that what do we need from universities to be able to I put in, into motion these building blocks of all these colored economy. And this has been mentioned by you, I think, and pretty much everybody. We can't have our, our, each of us very specialized in our own little thing and go forward. We need to have one specialty where we, we know deeply about one subject and a lot about a lot other, a lot, a lot other subjects in these areas. So if you're uh, deep knowledge and management, you need to have some basic knowledge and training in uh, oceans and climate change and, and other issues. Because if you don't, you're not gonna have the humility to know what you don't know. You won't know what you don't know and be able to go and seek that expertise and accept that expertise from those colleagues. And that's why at the UN, what I keep seeing is people that come to me and say, I found the solution to SDG 5, SDG 6, SDG 7. And I'm like, oh, you and a thousand others that came over the last two weeks. Have you talked to other people? No, 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 my solution. So we need to also, we need to train people because it's not, we all want to think we have the solution to everything. So we need to train people to be, to be humble and think that if they have an idea, they probably somebody else has talked about it before, but maybe that if you could put them together, it could help. We also need Chantaline, to talk about that is a beautiful note on which to end. We're running out of time. So oh, thank you. I love this call for radical collaboration. It's a theme coming through and everybody please focus on our common agenda. Love this idea of the SDGs and beyond. Uh, I also chair a task force at ASU with the Dean of Thunderbird on that subject. And we're seeing more and more universities using this integrated SDG framework, which I think is very exciting. And I'll blow a little horn for ASU. We're number one in the US and in the top 10 globally, but we need to encourage more universities to think about this transdisciplinary framework. And Chanteline, your call for a new economics for sustainable development is a wonderful segue to our final speaker, uh, Phoebe, who is the president of the European Association of Environment and Natural Resource Economists. So Phoebe, we're very much looking forward to hearing from you. We know that you're also the chair of UNSDN Greece, which is a wonderful global network that we are all grateful to be part of. So please tell us about your work and then Paul will come in to 
take Q and A. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you for the introduction. Uh, quickly introduce uh, my um, my team. Uh, I um, I lead this international cluster of sustainability transition that is composed of different uh, research uh, institutes uh, that I direct, and of course, uh, it also includes uh, the Sustainable Development Solutions Network. I chair the. Greek, but also the European hub with more than 400 institutional members. In the um, research institutions that I lead, we work uh, very much on um, research and innovation projects, innovation acceleration, deep demonstration, education, training, and policy interface. I've introduced this in my previous uh, keynote, so I'm going very quickly here. And what we are focusing on is really trying to to find sustainable pathways uh, for uh, facing the main crisis of our time, the pandemic, economic recession, climate change, and biodiversity collapse, and uh, trying to find integrated approaches to put um, into action the different agendas and the different policies that are there across the world, the SDGs, the Paris Agreement, uh, the European policies that have to do with the green and digital transition, which are a leadership example of how this transition is going to uh, be accelerated uh, in terms of uh, transposing uh, the vision into policies and regulations and laws, and also trying to see this um, transition as a transformation a transformation that uh, could be uh, uh, focused uh, in the uh, in, in in six transformation pathways and this is something that SDSN has announced in 2019 during the New York Climate Week so basically we can operationalize the SDGs through six transformations transformation in education health energy decarbonization sustainable food production land volunteer and oceans, sustainable cities and communities, and the digital revolution for sustainable development. What is interesting for you to see here is that no SDG is fully achieved without the others being achieved as well. So we are, are looking, we need a, a, a deep transformation that is holistic, systemic, and interdisciplinary and definitely heavily science driven. So the role of the universities is there. And uh, what uh, it is important to understand is that when we are talking about transformations, we are talking about uh, systemic transformations that will allow us uh, to escape in incremental changes and, and really achieve a fundamental transformation of the economic, social, and financial system that will trigger exponential change in decarbonization rate in biodiversity and um, uh, resilience and conservation, but also in terms of um, social cohesion and economic ability to produce positive um, uh, growth multipliers and job positions. And to be able to achieve that, uh, you really need to uh, think uh, or we uh, we propose the systems thinking uh, that is um, uh, combine um, systems thinking with the process of innovation in order to transform what you have in place and be able uh, to uh, restructure the way your different systems, the economic, the social, the environmental system perform and interact in order to achieve the incremental change you need. In this SBSN um, report that basically summarizes many of our work and uh, uh, and papers and publications and books. I lead a, a team of 150 researchers with uh, more than 
um, uh, a, a multi-million project on research projects, uh, one of the most significant ones in Europe. Uh, basically, what we try to do is uh, to identify the technological pathways in detail that will integrate, that will identify the optimal mixture of the renewable circular economy, nature-based solutions, climate adaptation, and digitalization that we are allow us this um, simultaneous address of our multiple objectives, because we want to achieve decarbonization, uh, good health, education, quality education, sustainable cities and communities, digitalization, and promote the right mixture of policy instruments and technological solutions that can be used across. And we basically need to do this in the energy system, in the mobility system, and in the land use system. And these are the systems that we work on and we need innovation in all of this system. What is important, and I'm happy that I've heard this, is to be able to incorporate the value of nature, the value of unpaid work, the value of all this positive environmental and social proof, uh, footprint that is uncounted for. And the way to account for this is to really translate the, um, the services, the ecosystem services into uh, human well-being and human wealth being into money. And this is a total economic value approach. I've devoted almost one uh, third of my work and my research is devoted to this. And now um, uh, uh, basically identifying the different aspects of value uh, that um, uh, the environment uh, produces, natural capital produces, social capital produces, and uh, using different techniques uh, to monetize this. Once you monetize, you are able to incorporate in decision-making processes, in cost-benefit anal uh, uh, um, uh, analysis, and be able in this way uh, to allocate budgets in a way that is optimal uh, optimal allocation of your resources. And in order to do that, not only you need the methodology, uh, the literature is quite extensive, but you also need to uh, reconceptualize your financial system. You need to reconceptualize the macro level of your financial system to integrate uh, this uh, nature value and the social value into the decisions of, you, uh, of the uh, central banks into the decision of the national public investment organizations and into the decision of the companies. And not only integrate these values, but also uh, um, uh, reconceptualize the missions of these financial institutions in order to be able to provide the, the long-term strategic patient finance that will support sustainability because it will support innovation. All this transition, all this transformational transition needs a lot of innovation and you need to reconceptualize your financial system in order to support innovation. And there are very many instruments that uh, uh, allow you to do that and and uh, uh, maybe, I, I think i will conclude bring... yes yeah, i will you. conclude so i will I, I can share my presentation many different financial instruments that allow you to do that we've been working on this for the last 25 years let me just say that what is also important is to allow uh, this is how the SDG on education uh, performs today across the world. Red means very bad, green means it is mad. So we are, uh, there are areas uh, in the world where quality education is not provided and most of the world has not achieved these SDGs. So uh, what is important for us is to invest in education that is there 
easiest and faster way to allow for the transformation. And in order to do that, you really need to reconceptualize the mission of a university <coughs> somewhere. You need to uh, include interdisciplinary uh, courses, you need to include systemic thinking, you need to uh, include holistic thinking, you need uh, to connect innovation with the universities, you need to connect uh, innovation uh, uh, universities and the labor market in a way that they can work together in order to produce the systemic and transformational solution that uh, the society wants. And this is why SDSN, together with other great institutions, have launched Mission 4.7 to bring together leaders from government, academia, civil society, and businesses to accelerate the implementation of education for sustainable development around the world. Thank you so much for your patience. Thank you, Phoebe. Uh, we are at a point in this uh, conversation that I'm somewhat dumbstruck. I want to acknowledge that I think in the last 90 minutes, I have witnessed the five smartest women put forth ideas that do not need to be questioned. I think we need to follow the suggestions that have been put forward. And uh, it also gives me the sense that we need more women to lead. Large part of the problems of the world is created by men white men, old men, and they are the ones that are stopping us from moving in the directions that all of you have pointed out. So I do not want to second guess. I do not want you to be questioned. I think your ideas is where we need to be going. So thank you very much. But I do want to give Hazel the last word. A woman's last word is always more interesting. Hazel, one minute. I was just thrilled with all these presentations. I can't wait to get in touch with you all. And I've already signed up to Phoebe's newsletter and I want to work with all of you. And uh, it's time, we, the only thing we haven't tried yet uh, is this beyond patriarchy model, um, which is partnership, true partnership between men and women. And, and thank you, Paul, for being, being such a generous, beautiful uh, brother. Thank you. thank you all. And I hope you all enjoy the rest of the evening or morning, wherever you are. Thank you, Amanda, for everything that you are doing from Mars. Bye-bye.